Thanks, Callum. Uh, good evening. My name is Rosa Murray and I'm a member of the Scottish Laity Network. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the first evening of our Lenten journey 2023. Uh, just to see everybody again is really lovely and to welcome new members as well. The theme um, for our, this year, for our overall theme, is the common good. The concept of the common good has a long history in the Catholic Church and is at the heart of Catholic social teaching. But what exactly does it mean in the world of today for us as disciples of Jesus? This is the focus of our Lenten journey, to reflect on the common good and the context of our discipleship. And the way we will journey together aligns with Pope Francis's Lenten message this year. In his message, Pope Francis, reflecting on our current personal and ecclesial reality, invites us to experience the Gospel of the Transfiguration. Pope Francis presents the Transfiguration as Jesus responds to the failure of his disciples to understand him. Our Lenten journey is an opportunity to reflect on how well we not only understand Jesus, but how we can authentically follow him in word and deed. It is a unique and special time. During this liturgical season, the Lord takes us with him to a place apart. While our ordinary commitments compel us to remain in our usual places and are often repetitive and sometimes boring routines, during Lent we are invited to ascend a high mountain in the company of Jesus and to live a particular experience of spiritual discipline as God's holy people. So that this transfiguration may become a reality in us this year, Pope Francis proposes two paths to follow in order to ascend the mountain together with Jesus and with him to attain the goal. The first path, listen to him. Lent is a time of grace to the extent that we listen to him as he speaks to us through scripture. In addition to the scriptures, the Lord speaks to us through our brothers and sisters, especially in the faces and the stories of those who are in need. The second path, rise and do not be afraid. Do not take refuge in a religiosity made up of extraordinary events and dramatic experiences out of fear of facing reality and its daily struggles, its hardships and contradictions. As is our tradition, let us now spend a few minutes in prayer bringing to mind the faces and stories of those who are in need, such that we may overcome our fear of facing reality and its daily struggles, its hardships and contradictions. Remembering especially the people of Ukraine on this, the eve of the anniversary of the Russian invasion.
it's my pleasure now to hand over to a friend of ours, Marion Pallister, who's also a SCIAF ambassador, who will say a few words about SCIAF and then welcome and introduce our companion for this evening. Thanks, Marion. Thank you, Rosa, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, it's an honour and, and a pleasure to be here this evening wearing my SCIAF hat uh, as ambassador for the Diocese of Argyll and the Isles. That sounds a very grand title, and all it means is that I spread the word about Skiaf's work in as many parishes as possible in our geographically challenging diocese, which stretches from Campbelltown, a, a few miles short of Ireland, to Stornoway, where we're heading for Norway. It also means that I've learned so much about the work of the official international aid and development organization of the Scottish Bishops Conference in the 18 years I've carried out this voluntary work. And I've been privileged to visit projects in Kenya, Tanzania and elsewhere. Right now, my own Bishop, Brian McGee, is Bishop President of Skiath. And if you're on social media, which I'm sure you all are, You'll have seen his very moving reports from Ethiopia, where he's visiting Skiaf projects. As he said in one of his posts, just the other day there, when people hear of Skiaf, they immediately think of responses to extreme poverty or sudden emergencies, such as the recent earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, or the war in Ukraine. This of course is true, but SCIAF is much more than that. As our official aid agency, SCIAF implements Catholic social teaching, which has at its core integral human development. It is not sufficient to merely ensure people are fed, crucial as this is, but the whole human person must be allowed to develop. This year, your wee box that you'll get this weekend uh, focuses on the work done in Zambia by Skiaf, where women are being empowered through local agencies funded by probably your donations to Skiaf. Because Skiaf doesn't do handouts, it does hands up. Uh, aid that will ensure local development of not just individuals, but communities and ultimately countries. And of course, SCIAF advocates for the Scottish and UK governments for the most vulnerable people in our common home, linking the dots of climate change, poverty, migration and peace for those politicians who perhaps don't grasp the connections and are therefore cavalier in cutting aid and turning away uh, refugees and migrants. Bishop Brian's visit to Ethiopia has set the scene for many of us following him on Facebook, but how much better to hear from someone who actually is from that country. And that's why it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome our companion for this evening, uh, Maluma Mbet Asefa Kasa. Mulum Mbet is currently a PhD candidate at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum, where she's doing doctoral research in the field of international development cooperation. Before joining Angelicum, she had more than 10 years of work experience on program coordination and administrative assistance in the Archdiocese of Addis Ababa and the Ethiopian Catholic Secretariat. In her current uh, extracurricular pursuits, she's involved in different kinds of church and other NGO activities. She's a member of Interfaith Peace Building Initiative and a founding member of Amen Ethiopia. Dialogue and peace building. So for me, a soul sister, if I wear both my ski off and my Pax Christi Scotland hats. In addition, she was a member of the National Young Catholic Workers Movement, which gave her an opportunity to be nominated and work as part of the training commission 
for the international coordination of young Christian workers from 2015 to 2017. So we look forward so much to hear about your work today, Mulu Membet. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? You can hear me, yes? Perfect, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And then it's been a great honor for me to give a speech to people well experienced and um, in different aspects of their profession life or in the church activity. So it's my honor to be here with you today to share. Uh, it's a little bit that I know about the, the, the social uh, teaching of the church and especially the common good, which is my uh, really interesting topic uh, uh, of one of the interesting topic of the social doctrine of the church. So for today, uh, we may see that some, some, some basic uh, uh, points of the social doctrine of the church with, in relation to the common good so that we can see in the in the real life context of our social life or within the the, the society and within the church uh, that we are living uh, this day so to begin that we will uh, i will i will ask a simple question that uh, so that you can share your thoughts your or you reflect or you can send it by chat uh, that what do we observe currently in, in the world that we are living now? So if you can um, post some, some points, some two, three points that one of the parts, uh, the organizers can read it for us, uh, just so we can take like two, three minutes on this uh, reflection. Chaos, mm -hmm. injustice, mm -hmm. war and peacemaking, gross inequality, human activity destroying the planet, sadness, dysfunction, ideas of justice are changing, power blocks, a loss of hope. Social exclusion, corruption, a lack of compassion, the breakdown of many established systems, care and compassion in some communities, a dichotomy between faith and political decision making, indifference, suffering, confusion, People making a lot of money from fossil fuels and the poor. And great poverty amidst the great wealth. The age old battle between good and evil. Local solutions to global problems. Loneliness. opportunity and a thriving military industrial complex. Postmodernism, a failure to act fast enough on the climate crisis. Some people making huge profits such as dealers in gas and other fuels while others struggle to eat and keep warm. systemic self-interest, a lack of consciousness, challenge, increased poverty, impact of climate change and increased pressures on societies and toxic social media. Migration, A 
an increasing lack of engagement with truth, political incompetence, searching, corrupt leaders. Thank you. Thank you uh, for all the participants and um, our host that was helping us to read all the comments of the, 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 the participants. So what I'm going to do today is, uh, as, as we have seen that there are different uh, things that we can observe in the world these days of the, the world that we are living currently now. So mostly they focus on the, uh, the social injustice on human person specifically, because whether they are connected to the environmental issues, social issues, everything. So the, at the center, we find that the, 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 the lack of justice to the human person that was created in the image of God. So what is the Catholic social teaching respond to this kind of situation and how, um, uh, well, we all know that what is the Catholic social teaching, so I may not go deeply into that section, but uh, we will see that what are the elements that we can see on the social teaching, and then we will continue to the common good. So the social teaching are made up of three elements, principles of reflection, criteria of judgment, and guidelines for action. So the principle of reflection apply across many different times in place, but the guidelines for action can change for different societies or time. Uniform guidelines for action wouldn't work because societies are in different form on one another. Like as you, as we have heard about what's going on, and then what individual people that can observe in the in the reality of the world. That so it's it's different from place to place, from individual in their point of view, in their experience, in the reality that they are living. So these things may not be uniform to all, but based on the, 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 they are always changing over time, creating a new situation which with different problem and possibilities also. So the second element is the criteria of judgment may be uh, the middle axiom or meditating between the highly authoritative but necessarily general and abstract principles of reflection and the details of the concrete society, society social, social reality. They are less authoritative than the principles of reflection, but more than the guidelines of reflection or of action. So the guidelines of action are the third element is always depending on the contingent judgment of the information available through human knowledge. There is frequent scope of the legitimate difference of opinion among believers and range of social injustice issues. So these are the elements that we see. And then uh, there is a methodology as you have heard also about my previous experience in life is like I'm a member of the YCWN and I really, really love to see things on the CJJ Act methodology. Mm -hmm. So this method was also introduced in the, in the Vatican Second Council uh, by Joseph Carden, who was the founder of YCW and then the part of the, the council at that time. And then it's during this time that the church fathers start to see things with the, with the theme of uh, science of the time. So uh, one of the most uh, striking that one of the uh, documents that was produced the, to, during the Vatican Second Council is the Gaudium et Spes. And then one of the striking characteristics of this document is reading of the science of the time its introductory survey of the situation of human beings in the modern world is a remarkable snapshot of the uh, conciliar area. The council fathers speak on the rapid change brought about by the modernity, including political and social struggles for freedom, the rise of science and the technology that springs from it, gain in the rights of women and workers, globalization, and even the decline of the religious practice of modern men and women. Maybe that those words are here, uh, we can see them, they may be a bit articulated way, but those uh, signs of the time that you were responding on the previously, most of them, they are connected to this kind of problems also. 
the way that we explain to them may be different, but they are connected to this kind of uh, problems. So uh, the image evoked by this survey is both optimistic and scrutinizing modernity presents both reason for the hope and cause of concern. In total, the fathers of the fathers of that uh, council describes the modern world as full of inequalities or imbalance, and there are symptoms of the deeper inequilibrium or of the man himself. In this reading of the internal struggle in the human heart that allows the problem Christ as one who can show man the way in strengthen him through the spirit and in order to be worthy of his destiny. While this proclamation of Christ is aimed at the council's reading of that time of the modern world, of that time, not now, one can still take the constitution or certain pedagogy of the science of the time that endures. There's almost six years of the council now that we are the document and, uh, and the document the uh, Gaudium et Space was produced in 1965. Our image of the world may include significant difference from the one described by the council, significant. And yet the council method of reading human experience in proclaiming Christ as its purification and fulfillment of others, the church offers the church a way in which to undertake its, its enduring mission of evangelization. To better understand this pedagogy, we are helped by the returning to those sources of the praise or uh, the word in Latin sigma temporano which was mentioned in the document at that time. In the Humani Salutis, the document by which summoned the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII first used the phrase, signs of the time, referring to the Gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 16. It says that in the morning, you will say it will rain today because the sky is bloody and cloudy. You know how the distinguish distinguished face of the sky and can't you distinguish the signs of the time so this based on this that pop uh, john 23rd saint john 23rd introduced this idea of reading the sign of the time to uh, to address the situation as a christian and as part of the church and then the church responds to these situations Later in 1963, I mean, before, uh, when, he, when he wrote also the Pachim interviews that at that time it was a critical situation, the phrase was used as a heading for what the Pope perceived to be positive development and in that time. For uh, this use, he can't be gathered that John 23rd, signs of the time referred to this characterization and events of current history that manifest the present condition of humanity. Though he especially wished to highlight those signs that could be perceived as a positive, John 23rd indicates both the negative and positive characteristics of such signs. Um, we can see that the, this, the signs are not always negative. There are some positive signs also uh, that are helping to progress the humanity, thereby calling upon the church to distinguish between these two that, but we have to distinguish between the good, the positive and the negative signs of the time so that we can respond to them properly. It was with history in mind that the council fathers utilized the phrase uh, signs of the time in Gaudium et Spes, seeing such signs as particular insights in humanity that could provide the material need for the church's dialogue with the modern world. So these are uh, the points that we that this is the main reason that we have to read the signs of the time so that we can respond in a manner of uh, to be as to be the voice of God. So there are key themes in the social doctrine of the church because uh, chronologically through the uh, key documents of the social magistrate uh, examine their content, 
by tracing these ideas that we may find different topic of the time of different time and then the church responds uh, to these situations uh, as we know that the social uh, doctrine uh, the social uh, documents uh, was produced by the first one was by leo 13th rerum novarum and then there are quadragesimo anno materi magistrate facem interris and and then it goes and then until laudato si so these are the response of the church for different issues, different uh, signs of the time to respond to this kind of uh, re, uh, situations that was happening in the, within the church, uh, within the society. So there are two main principles that we have to examine the church that has to conceive her role in different social and historical contexts. The first one is the principle to respect the dignity of each man, regardless of their difference in every aspect. And the second one is the principle, on the other hand, is the promotion of the common good. So dignity of uh, the human dignity is starting point in central concern for the Catholic thinking about human rights. Uh, we know that it was the, the Catholic, uh, the dignity of human person has to be on the center of main, mainly those who are the, uh, on, the, on all the documents and activities of the, the church also. Each person is created in the image and likeness of God. And so as in, in lineable transcendent God-given dignity, it allows that each member of the human family is equal dignity and has equal rights because we are all children of the one God. We are sisters and brothers to each other. We understand God, the Trinity of person. And so we see the image of reflected not only in individual, but also in community. So when you speak about the human dignity, it has to be seen as an individual and then within the community that that person was is living. Together in the community, we bear the image of God. So we cannot separate the community from individual and the individual from the community. So they, they both uh, go together. Together in the community, we bear the image of God whose ve very nature is communal. The Catholic tradition is opposed to anything that is uh, opposed to life itself or that violates the integrity of the human person and anything in that insults human dignity, the human right, and the things due to his simply because we are human beings. They are the claims made by human dignity. So in this that we can raise some question that uh, from this principle of the human dignity, we can, we can raise a question of the following, uh, the criteria to help judge the social situation. So there are uh, the, those, just uh, remember that those who things that you explained to explain them before, like what we are observing in the world. So for these things to uh, to judge is this this situation. So we have to ask that does this situation respect and promote human dignity, whether it can be a positive or negative. Of course, if it's negative. Uh, it may not promote the human dignity, but there are some positive aspects also that we have to see. And what is happening to people and to their dignity in this situation? So you mentioned that even on the, on the prayer that earlier that we see that we are facing a lot of some difficulties in people who are in need, especially those who are involved or in man-made or natural disaster in everywhere in the world. Maybe we, we reflect on the, on the war in Ukraine, but recently, a few days ago, a couple of weeks, uh, what, what's happening in Syria and Turkey, it needs like uh, the, the, the collaboration of everyone so that those people who are suffering can, uh, can pass this, difficult time with dignity at least they have to be respected with with their human dignity so the second principle is the common good which is our main uh, idea of this this evening 
the common good according to the social uh, in the social compendium of the catholic church that we find the definition in number 164 the principle of common good to which every aspect of social life must be related if it is to attain its fullest meaning stems from the dignity unity and equality of all people according to this primary and broadly accepted sense the common good indicates the sum total of social conditions which allow people either as group or individual to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily it continues uh, in the same uh, part of the document the common good does not consist in the simple sum of the particular goods of each subject of the social entity belonging to everyone and to each person it is in and remains common because it's indivis indivisible and because only together in it's possible to attain it increase it and safeguard its effectiveness with regard also to the future just as the moral actions of an individual are accomplished in doing what is good so too the action of the society attain their full statue when they bring about the common good so when if individual has an obligation to to arrive to do some to accomplish doing something good and then even the same thing the society has to do the same issue same action to reach into this common good level the common good in fact can be understood as the social and com community dimension of the moral good so um the common good is understood in the collection of social conditions that make it possible for each society, social group and for all their individual members to achieve their potential. It means that each social group must take account of right and aspiration of other groups and of all the world being of the whole human family. The rights and duties of individual in groups must be harmonized under the common good. Questions that flow from this principle when judging the social situation, we have to see always social situation. That's why that we raise what we are observing these days before, because in every aspect that we have to see on how to judge this situation, like uh, based on the gospel, based on the social situation, that we based on the experience that we have, based on the social uh, magisterium documents of the church. So we have to judge the situation, whether it's good or bad, and how we have to deal on it. So the question can be, are the benefits enjoyed by some group attained only at the cost of other groups? So these are the questions that we have to ask always. We can see that. Uh, and uh, the other one is, are the consequences of this policy or programs or strategies for those living in poor country. So does it have this kind of, these policies have a consequence in the poor countries that some of you, we may have, you may have some experience in, especially in the countries uh, who are really in need. Uh, earlier, our host was uh, talking about the SCAF projects in different parts of the world, especially in Africa, in Ethiopia, that I have been experiencing. Uh, they contribute a lot. So, on the other hand, there are some other policies that to make a profit or to do something or to get uh, a better position in, in some situation, they their policy might not be considered about the situation of the poor country or poor people or vulnerables. So all these things has to be considered while trying to judge this social situation in, in, the, in the concept of this common good. Well, common good by itself has sometimes uh, a bit, uh, uh, it, it has a debate a deal because of the understanding of this common good. During the 1930s and 40s, there was a great deal of debate, sometimes quite intense in the nature and limits of the common good. Uh, some ask that is a common good a final cause, the greatest good of human person? So they ask this situation. The philosophers involved in this debate confronted the challenge of formulating a political philosophy which all the 
uh, all the while recognizing the value of the role of the state, emphasizing the dignity of the human person. So earlier that we see that the corruption, bad leadership, all these things that maybe they will ignore the dignity of human person because, because of this egoistic uh, nature of that person who is practicing those things. So common good uh, will be uh, forgotten. But in the meantime, if we say that that person action is common to himself and good to himself, not common, good to himself, then the individual good and the common good of the society, how can uh, they have to be dealt together so that uh, we have to reach to this uh, common sense of the, the understanding of the common good. Without how we're reducing the dignity of the interests of the individual in the classical liberal sense. So this, you have to consider these things. The problem uh, of the common good is still relevant today because of this uh, the individual individualistic idea of uh, good. Because if for one person is something is good, what about for the communal group, for the others? Can we consider it as a, as a good to, to everyone? Uh, at a time when political discourse of, often seems to oppose the good of the political community to that of each of its members, so that we can we can see that the the real context of the war in uh, Ukraine. So, for one part, it might be a good, and for the other part, it's uh, it's an uh, um, crossing the line of the dignity and the sovereignty of one country. So, this situation for has to be. Um, put in table so that like clearly so that we can we, just like that how we eat on the plate when we uh, put the food on the plate and then we just we know how to cut it we have to, you know how to, before you put it into our mouth so these things has to be kept in in a real uh, clear manner so that to find the solution for this kind of situation let's maybe uh, from what i saw from your previous uh, uh, presentations from someone that was explaining about what's going on in Ethiopia. So the same thing that both both parts they may say that uh, it's for the good of those they are uh, leading or representing, but in the meantime there were human beings who were suffering with, because of this conflict, or uh, we may say that uh, because of the war. So this kind of things has to be considered properly when we reach into the idea of common good. So uh, the other principle of common good, how to imply in the social doctrine of the church that we can see is uh, the common good itself is together with, the, with those conditions of social life that are low post collective and individual members to reach their perfection more fully and more quickly. The principle of common good derives from the dignity, unity, and equality of all people. So these things we have to, con the, the, when we discuss about the common good and the social doctrine of the church, so they are the, their connection is based on these two things. So um, just to give a highlight, the, the, there are four fundamental values of social life according to the social doctrine of the church. We may all know this, but just, just to, to go on with the reflection. The first principle is, uh, the first fundamental value is the truth. Uh, and the second is freedom, third is justice, and uh, the fourth is love. The, the order is not uh, necessarily one, two, three, but they are this, these are the four points that we have to see on the, on the value of the social life according to the social doctrine of the church. So justice, especially we heard that what's going on in the world, what we are observing is mostly connected to the injustice situation that man creates to the other human being, to the nature, the society, to the community, to the individual. So these are the injustice situations. But what did St. Thomas say about this? Um, social justice that we call, uh, or the, the virtue of justice. 
justice is the order of human relations in the moral virtue by which one observes duty in law in oneself and in the other. It's constant and perpetual desire to recognize to everyone what is due to him. It's the office or the magistrate or the place where justice is done. The denial of justice or the failure of to apply the criteria of justice is injustice. So we cannot deny. If we deny it's by itself, it's injustice. Well, sometimes the, some people say that justice de delayed is justice denied also. And that we can see those things that is connected to, to most of the political or economic or environmental situation what's, that we are observing. Uh, in our in our era the legal or social justice that we according to saint thomas directs all virtues towards the common good it is the need to suppress the misery inequality exploitation oppression of workers or poor people through the political program to implement the particular reform of the economy and the society in general. So there are community co commutative justice and distributive justice, which are regulated the relationship between the individual, which is this is the commutative justice and distributive justice regulates the relationship between the, the, the company or the community and its members. So this, this is how St. Thomas see justice has to be implemented and why it's needed. To, to give a summary on this, uh, on this issue that the, the relationship of the dignity of human person to the common good can be described variously at the relationship to start point or to the point of arrival. So it's a starting point by itself, a common good, and then it's an arrival point the relationship between the common good and the human dignity. This relationship is not one of the uh, contrarieties of the individual to political community. It is rather the good of individuals being completed and realized by the common good. While contrariety is in a position within the same subject, the relationship of the involvement of the movement of one in the same subject from its natural perfection to its final perfection. This movement for us is human action, ethical behavior of the sake of our final happiness or uh, felicity. The pursuit of the common good is human action carried out to attain the good, the good of each one of us, which no person can attain by himself. So we are responsible for the happiness of the others, especially um, this is a good moment, especially Lent season is a good moment for us to see others. Because some of them, because of different social problems, economic problems, political problems, or natural disaster that we are facing these days, like what we see a couple of weeks ago. So those people, they cannot reach into that happiness. That's why they need the help of others. That's why we have to be accompanying those who are really in need. Otherwise, uh, common good cannot be uh, achieved. Human rights, where, whether individual or collective, secure goods which person gain either individual or collective have a duty to give to the other. These goods, whether they are private goods or common goods, are the minimum requirements for distributive justice. So if justice is on the center of the social doctrine of the church, if justice is on the center of the, the achievement of the common good, then it has to be shared by others. The effectiveness, the effective sanction of the positive law rights guarantee access to those good in sharing of which the foundation of civil, uh, civic uh, friendship. So uh, with this, that we can see the, 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 how to judge the social situation. So we can see that what there is apparent conflict between the good of one person or a group 
and the political community or uh, different society as a whole. It must keep in mind that the good of the common good by definition is not an alien good, the private good or some of or some other individuals. The good of the whole is the good of each of its parts. So we cannot separate the good just to to certain group, to certain individual or some some else, but it has to be the whole has to be into that uh, consensus of the common good and then it has to arrive into that level. If the action in uh, our policies clearly are not good for the particular group or in society, then it's not a common good. So we have to say that we have to defend this, uh, this uh, issues when they are raised. So with this, that we can go to the next session of the our discussion that what can be done or what is our responsibility in this regard. So this is an open discussion for all of us that we have to share what we can do on these issues. I think the host can lead us into this uh, discussion now, or I don't know how, how they will manage to the next discussion. Well, thank you very, very much for leading us through um, that, that kind of minefield, I have to say, of, of information uh, that I'm sure will take time to digest, but there's already some things coming into the, the chat which I'd like to kind of draw on pretty much straight away. The first question comes from Anne who asks, how do we establish a global standard of the common good in the face of individuals who are operating out of self-interest? Well, I, I don't think that it's possible to have a common at the global level that uh, specific uh, or one line of the common good because situations are different in different country. It may be the same. So let's, let's raise that there is a war in one place, but different reality are in the context of that, that certain place. So it has to be defined in that context not in, we cannot put a general, the only thing that we have to do is that at the center of these programs, we have to put in mind that the human dignity has to be restored because in many places when there is, uh, when there are problems that we are facing, it's a human dignity is uh, is losing the, 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 what it's supposed to be the destiny of that human person. So, uh, well, in my opinion, it's really difficult to reach into one line definition of the common good of this situation, but this, the context has to be analyzed also, because that's that's why we need to analyze in every aspect the, the context. And I think that that's a, a theme that's also been picked up in the, the chat, and please do continue to share your, your questions, your thoughts, your reflections in the chat um, on, on tonight's content would be really, really helpful to, to get the discussion going. But if I can just draw rather than questions on a couple of comments that have been shared in the chat and get your, your take on them a little bit. The, the first one I'm going to take comes from, from Pete, who says, we establish a global standard of the common good by observing the link between the subjective and the objective that you've described. Would, would you draw on that for us? Sorry? So Pete says, we establish a global standard of the common good by observing the link between the subjective and the objective that you've described. Well, that, that's, that's a general idea. I mean, like when we implement this, the principle of this common good that we have to see the context line, the line of the, as we, as the, our, our uh, person that we give the comment that says, the, the subject and the object, maybe they are different in different contexts. So if we put a single line, that's why I'm saying that it's, it's really difficult to, to put it in one. Of course, common good is in the, in the principle that we saw, it's, it's to reach the, uh, to the fullness of the human person and in more easily way. That's why that we need to, eat, to help to each other. But the context has to, we always have to see the context of that situation. I mean, 
uh, there that's that's why that it's a debate be, be between the private good and the common good because for sometimes that if it's a private good is good for me but it's not good for the communal how do we have to address this situation as i said that that's a simple example that we see that for between the uh, russian and ukrainian war if we go to that russian part that they may say they are doing it to restore their dignity or sovereignty of the country but they are in the meantime they are attacking another country so it can be it looks like a good for them but in the meantime it's uh, destroying the other nation the same thing let's go to ethiopia that i don't know if you have some some idea about what was happening uh, until recently that until they got some reconciliation between the uh, the original party and the federal government but they both have some based on their their definition that they both have some truths to reach into to, to to they want to achieve something but in the meantime they were doing against the humanity so even when when this is in a political level but individually that what is good for me individually may not be good for the community so these things that's why that it's really difficult to define but always we have to consider that the the that in where that individual belongs to into the community into the society within the church outside the church so my good has to be doesn't have to oppose the good of the community just for the sake of myself if i'm going to do something and then it's 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 okay for me but i have to consider that's why that is really uh that's why it's becoming debatable especially this this issue i don't know if i answer uh my i wonder if we stay with that theme though and, and think so so anthony has put a comment in saying common good is not essentially an event it's much more a process and a way of being but where does that process begin within individual always always something has to start with an individual because most of the things uh, were created by by the man himself that even in the document said that by the man himself were created those those problems so it's individual has to start that that individual action has to be collective also into the society that he belongs or she belongs so i wonder if, if that answers the next question then which asks if the common good varies in different contexts how small can that context become i suppose you're saying that the context can be individual can be individual and communal also because can we uh, uh, i don't think that we can separate that of course there is an individual always starts from the individual but that, that individual there is a community that he belongs to the society that he belongs to so we cannot separate those two things so if the common good of one person is respected in the same manner it has to be the society that he belongs or she belongs has to be respected but uh, the if the community common good is respected but that individual of that community is not into the level of that uh, dignified or justified life so this will be in conflict but always since community starts within so the first person the, the the first action has to come from oneself so that to contribute to the other based on the the capacity that we have as an individual do you think it would help if we used this language more kind of regularly more openly if we were using the language as Gemma says of human dignity and the common good more often in our campaigns for justice and claiming the language of social teaching and using it exactly a hundred percent i said if we have to uh, if we have to um, make a change especially it's at the, at the center of if at the center of the situation is the human person then we have to use human dignity is the center and then justice the center so that the common good has to respond to these things and then i think what we lack 
uh, in the in the in the context of the modern world, it is like using some strong words into the in the in this to this context. Usually, sometimes we think that no, this is are the church language. No, they are not. As as individual, okay, we are Christians. Maybe we have some responsibility as a Christian to act upon them, but we have to use those words so that we can address the situation. Let's see uh, how Laudato Si was influential, not only in the church, but also globally. So we have to use those words. Uh, recently when I was doing my, I'm, I'm doing my research and, and I was, I, I'm doing on the, on the, uh, the current economy that in Ethiopia that we have based on the agriculture. And what the gap that I see was the ethical component of that, the situation. Because these farmers, they live really, really in poor situation. And um, for, your inform for your surprise that I couldn't even find a real data of the smallholders, the number of smallholders, because no one gives attention to them. But our life, our table depends on their production. So this ethical component, since we, we Christians, we didn't speak loudly about these issues, we cannot make any difference. That's why that the, the human dignity, and usually we have to, even we have to push loudly on these issues also to make a change that we want to see in the world. And it definitely is a language that, that strikes a chord with, with so many across different sectors of society. Uh, I was intrigued when you mentioned Laudato Si there. I'm sure that many of us who watched um, the letter, the film about Laudato Si recently at its, its Scottish premiere um, online would, would be struck by that idea that it, it does, as a document from Pope Francis, strike a chord across society. I suppose that would be a good example of the language connecting with people from all religions and none of all cultures and different backgrounds. Exactly. So I, I think that we have to use it. We have to use loudly those values, the Christian values, the gospel words that can make a difference in the world. So we can we have to use them, I think. Now we've we've spoken about the, the need for the individual to accept responsibility at that level. But but Marion's question then is how do we persuade or convince the individual arms dealer, for example, that their actions are not for the common good? Well, I think that's a very tough question because first that everyone has to have is he has to use his conscious. Um, otherwise that we cannot make a difference. So a that's why that it's really difficult. That's why that we cannot make any any change in the world. That so, some issues are getting worse because of this kind of thing. Because our conscience is not telling us to do the right thing. Only things are focusing that on the on the, 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 the Christian. Those who practice in Christianity, they can do this easily because they their life depends on or based on the gospel. But those who are, for example, those arm dealers. Their main point is to get money, to get profit from that. And then they know the consequence of what they are doing, their action, but they don't care about that. So the rest of the world, the rest of the good people, instead of keeping quiet, we have to come out to speak about these issues. And sometimes what I observe is that in Ethiopia, I have to give that example in Ethiopia, that there are some situations when something happens that the good people, they keep quiet. They don't do anything. And then that's why the other group are going onto the surface and then winning the situation. But the good people have to speak on this. They have to push. So individuals have to use their conscious part so that they can make a difference on that. That's, that's what I can say, I don't know. That's helpful. And, and I suppose we've spoken about the need to embrace the language. We've spoken about the importance of human dignity and common good and the language around this. But I, I want to draw on Anne's comment here around the fact that it's not always a political priority or a, a priority in established structures, be that church or state. And so when we're faced with these barriers, how 
do we achieve the goal of common good? In in the barriers of the well, which barriers that mostly? Look, I think Anne, Anne is speaking about barriers from established structures, be that figures within the church or figures within the state, political figures. What's the intention behind those the, the, this established? Um, I think so. The, the context, I suppose, that the context that's quite helpful and, and something that's come up through the chat a few times tonight um, would be things like the the hostile environment towards refugees um, mm -hmm. that refer to extensively here in the UK. Um, so this kind of political um, priority being other than the common good. Well. Uh... What is the common good that we have to define in this situation? Because, for example, that the migrants or the situation that changed the, the, the current reality of one country because of this, and then they have to fall, work on the common good. So there is there, there has to be two things that has to be balanced because, for example, that there are mass migrants who's coming to Europe, for example, let's say, but that, that, that country, that nation needs to be also to move forward because the current situation by itself has to be dealt with the, with the by, by not adding anything on top of that. So these things are, have, to, uh, have to be addressed first from the source, from the source. For example, the migration, how did it happen? That's the social, uh, the social problem that we are facing these days because with migration, there are uh, different changes that welcoming them in what sense? The, the, those who have this economical problem, those who have some political problems, those who have so, some social problems also. Yes, we can say that. So in this context that uh, we can wait, um, how how can I say that? Helping to these people it may not. I mean, saying we cannot accept you, it's not, it's not against the common good. But that country also has to face, or that nation has to face also to to solve the the problem of what they are facing. So it has to be. That's why that we need a collective action in sometimes a collective action, not only one nation, but collectively the situation has to be studied well and then it has to be it has to go down to the source of that problem to to address those kind of issues maybe. And so running alongside this and, and staying with the theme of of how we define the common good. Helen asks, is the common good always determined by the good or the need of the majority? Mm, no, that's why that majority, that's why that we have to see the context because if it's only about the majority, then what about the minus? So those part, because when we say that, if it has to be, the, the it has to be all, the good of the whole is the good of each part of that, then when you say each part of that, it's not about majority and minus. So the whole without any difference has to be addressed into that context. So uh, I don't think that this majority thing can work with the common good issue. It works if, if it's for the benefit, but what about those who are not in that majority part? What about their human dignity? What about their uh, rights? So we have to see all these things. I don't think that uh, majority will respond to the question of the common good in the, especially in the in terms of the justice issues. If we return for a moment to the the political discussion, um, how do we develop a political system that is genuinely committed to work? in the interests of the common good, rather than just working for one section of society. Sorry? So how, how do we establish a, a political system that is working for the common good of all? Well, 
<laughs> you, you, you've only come here for the small questions. We don't do big <laughs> questions here. <laughs> Yeah, ex now, now, now it's like uh, I am in a position that really difficult to respond to this because a political system that it's it's supposed to be to to address the the need of the majority. Yeah, that usually political system is like that. But always, if they put the 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 human dignity at the center of any political program program, I think some issues has to be can be addressed. Otherwise, if it's only going to, to respond to the to the certain group, the need of certain group, it, we may not reach into this common good issue. But in every aspect, what is the best for that community or the society that a political program can be introduced has to be uh, kept in mind, I think. Maybe not. This one is really a bit tough for me. I don't know. Some of the participants may also can give some some reflection on this also if they. Does it help us to focus the mind when we think about the common good, if we focus on the preferential option for the poor? Of course. Of course. Yeah. And in that sense, th does that bring our focus away from the majority and onto the marginalised? Well, what is the effect of the marginalised on the majority? Okay. Yeah, so this, if the marginalised has an effect that earlier that I said that what is that when we judge the uh, social situation, that what is those, uh, the, 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 the uh, let me, what are the consequences of this policy for those living in the in that marginalized situation? So always we have to put in mind that if it has an effect on the majority, then addressing the issue of the marginalized might help to, to reach into that level of for the common good. And then thinking about that that interlink with policy. We have a question from, from Marion which asks, would it help the common good if our overseas aid were to be reinstated? So for example, and, and the climate emergency addressed so that migration could be reduced? In terms of this, uh, these issues, like the, the, there are different dimensions that are connected to the other, like social issues, uh, environmental issues, they are connected to one another. For example, if in one area there is a, the issue of climate change and then because of that people cannot live cannot produce and then to get their daily life they have to move on to the to the next city or to another country so addressing that environmental crisis might help to uh, stabilize the the society who are living there so those connected interconnected dimensions has always has to be uh, addressed well not we cannot we cannot see we cannot solve issues separately that one because these days everything is connected not only issues one country problem affects the whole country the whole nation sometimes globally just because of the war in ukraine how um the 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 the, the, the energy expense that we can see that how it was rise like this because it happens in one country, but it affects the whole. The same thing that if there is one crisis, crisis of environmental issues in one in one part of the world, it's connected to the rest. So those dimensions are connect, interconnected. In the meantime, one part of the world has suffering. That means the, the rest of the world is suffering also that. So always we have to see things. I mean, in 21st century, we cannot solve issues separately. It's what, that's my, my observation because it's all, everything is interconnected by its nature now. And that interconnectedness is, is reflected in the point that Gemma makes where the issues, for example, of racism, sexism, climate injustice, these would seem to be the antithesis of human dignity and the common good. There are people, however, who would you know, really stand up for the status quo, uh, perhaps resist change. 
and I'm really, really interested in this, this kind of the take of this question. How do we address these issues, but at the same time protect the human dignity of the perpetrators of these things? Ah, now a tough question. <laughs> Again, another tough question, because some, some uh, when we see in the eye of, in the, with the eye of the gospel that some points we have to, we have to address them in a way that what the gospel says also on that, what the Christian values are saying on that issue, because there are different issues that cannot be addressed in the same, in the same level with other, uh, um, other situations. For example, that what were the church fathers or the, 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 the popes when they produced different documents? At that time, the problems were different. Now we are facing another problem. It's some problems, they are totally against the Christian, Christian thought also, Christian teaching, some. But in the meantime, those people, they, they have to live in a dignified life. So it's not about punishment, but it's about correcting some issues also. So it needs to be corrected first to address, to bring it into the, into the, into the, in the issue of the injustice situation of the social issue. But before that, if there are things that has to be corrected, but in the meantime, those people, their dignity has to be respected at any cost because they are human beings. They are they were created in the they are created in the image of God in likeness. I think that touches on another question we've had around the the kind of interdependentness of, of human dignity and being made in, in God's image and likeness. I think you've you've touched on that. Another question, though, asks about the, the context of, of postmodernism and whether that has an impact on defining the common good. Yes. Yes. Earlier that I said that about this, especially the private good. Uh, there are some issues that still debating that if that's the, the, the wish of that single person or an individual, it's good for him. But can we consider it? It's a correct action so that it can bring the common good for the society. So the, the postmodernism is really, uh, the, the common good is uh, gets struggled or challenged by this uh, mentality of the postmodernism that we are facing nowadays, especially about the, the private good that we are putting here. So the private good and the common good sometimes conflict each other because of this, uh, the modern mentality and the modern concept of being human person. I want to take our next question from, from Nicholas and I just want to, to, to read it to you rather than rephrasing it at all, I want to read it to you as is. He says, the challenge of the common good leads us to ask whether current boundaries of our communities, whether these are secular or religious, need to be less divisive one from another so that we can overlap and interlink between two narrow starting points. He says, are we seeing the end of nation states? Do we need to rethink the myth of the Tower of Babel and, and ask if humankind needs to radically reevaluate how we will still hang together in the future? Mm. <laughs> well, honestly, uh, I, I don't know this, honestly speak. I mean, I cannot give a concrete uh, response of this, honestly. But if still the participants have something to share, I will be happy. It'd be interesting if, if anyone does have any thoughts to, to share comments and I, I'm really interested in that that particular bit though are we seeing the end of nation states do you think our interconnectedness as human beings perhaps feeds into that discussion perhaps something to to ponder and hopefully hopefully something that, that someone may have something to offer on, but certainly something to ponder throughout tonight. Uh, I'll move to Anne's question around the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, though. You know, a global standard that, that should be respected for every single person on the planet, but is still flouted, is still 
uh, walked over by powerful parties concerned with money making and prioritizing their own interests. When do you think, we, you know, when will the powerful groups driven by greed start to realize our interconnectedness as human beings? So, 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 my my i am using my phone and then it's the battery is dying so i will, i'm trying to connect to another device but uh, it's really, uh, uh so we, we we couldn't find anyone to respond to this question yeah. Yeah? We, we haven't had any comments on it yet but there, there is time there is time but I'm, I'm i'm asking you know in the context of of human rights the universal declaration the un declaration of human rights when do you think or do you think we will ever see a point in time when you know, powerful parties will no longer try to, to walk over these rights and instead will recognise the interconnectedness of all people? Uh, the human rights are in the... They mostly speak about the individual rights, yeah? Mm. But when are we going to put this collective rights also? Because common good is uh, in to dispose uh, in, in in this both way of addressing those issues like the, the, the communal and the individual. So uh, earlier that are we failing at the nation that uh, was the question that I I I don't think so, but we are having a different type of nation that we are because we are we are now living in a global glo globally that uh, so it's not the nation failing it's the nature is changing or the structure of that this kind of uh, uh, is is changing so the development has to bring i mean the development of this structural change has to be addressed also on the same manner with how to address for the common good and the human dignity at the center of this this progress well i am i am conscious of time and it's interesting because just as we return to that point the discussion is starting to open in the chat and perhaps it will continue um in the chat and perhaps indeed um it, it will continue for those who are staying on for the breakout rooms at the end, maybe that's something to, to ponder as well. Are we seeing the beginning of the end of nation states? Really uh, wonderfully interesting questions that have been brought up. And I, I think, you know, the conversation that's going on there, wonderful, starting to think about Fratelli Tutti, starting to think about the points that others have made. But thank you uh, very, very much, Malim, a bit for, for the conversation that you've had with, with me through uh, everyone else. You know, I, I'm just a uh, a spokesperson for everyone else's views uh, and it's it's wonderful to be able to have that conversation. I must say um, just a, a final word from, from me as we begin this Lenten journey. I always get slightly nervous at the start of the Q&A section and think there's never going to be enough questions and here we are half an hour later and we could go on for hours. So thank you very much for your time with us tonight. Thank so I much. am now going to hand back to, uh, I think I'm handing back to I've lost my place, Marion, who is going to say a few words. I'm, I'm just going to reiterate, I'm, I'm going to say a, a huge thank you. Um, you've challenged us and I'm sorry, we've challenged you as well. Um, and I'm sure that in doing so to each other, we've set, you've set us on a, what, a better path to lead us to the top of the, the Lenten mountain. Uh, you did say that we all know what Catholic social teaching is. In Scotland, we joke that Catholic social teaching is the church's best kept secret. <laughs> it can't be a secret. And okay. you've opened a door this evening, stressing the need to enable human dignity uh, for all our brothers and sisters. 
and and that's why I, I put that comment uh, in the chat about it being time to take Fratelli Tutti uh, much more seriously. Uh, we need that reminder. Um, so thank you again. And may we say a prayer for you, please. Hmm? Loving God, we thank you for the insight and companionship of Mulam Mebet. We thank you for the way she's rooted our Lenten journey in the Catholic social teaching, and we ask that you anoint her anew such that her study and ministry may continue to be empowered by your spirit. Amen. And we also pray for Skiath. Loving God, <clears throat> we thank you for the witness and loving action of Skiaf. We affirm and commit ourselves to their dream of a just world, free of poverty, where we flourish and live in harmony with each other and creation. Empower them with your spirit. And we conclude our evening by praying for ourselves as we go forth on our Lenten journey. During this liturgical season, may we seek to ascend that high mountain in the company of Jesus. May we truly listen to him in scripture and in the faces and the stories of our sisters and brothers, especially those who are in need. May the Spirit inspire us to rise and not be afraid as we face reality and its daily struggles its hardships and contradictions. Amen. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight and we look forward to being with you again next Thursday for the second evening of our Lenten journey with our companion David Coleman who is Ecumenical Eco-Chaplain for Eco Congregation Scotland. And he will be talking about creation and the common good. To those who are leaving the meeting at this point, good night, God bless, and we invite you to log off.